Hello and welcome to Hawkeye Nation. This is Hawkcast, your Iowa football, basketball, and recruiting podcast brought to you by Go Iowa Awesome and Rivals.com. I'm your recruiting analyst and host, Elliot Clough, at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by our publisher, Adam Jacoby, and managing editor, Ross Binder, here on this Saturday evening post spring game, spring open practice, I should say. Um, before we get started, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, drop a like, drop a comment. Let us know what you're thinking, your thoughts on uh, the open spring practice, who popped, who maybe disappointed you. Um, either way, we're here to uh, hear it. And if you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, listen, please subscribe, leave that rate and review. We appreciate it. Before we dive too much into the game, I want to hit on one thing quick. Iowa landed transfer from North Dakota, Cade Baroud today. Um, he had actually, uh, made the trip to the, to Iowa city for, for the game and, and was there and was in shorts, which per him, terrible idea. He told me that this afternoon, I spoke with him twice, excuse me, once, uh, following the, uh, the, the game today talked about his commitment, his decision to end up at Iowa. And of course we have a free article there talking about who he is, what he'll do at Iowa. Um, you can check both of those out at iowa.rivals.com. If you're not a premium subscriber yet, you can do that today. iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe, get that premium article and hear him talk specifically about his decision. Um, before we dive too much into the spring game, guys, just initial thoughts on seeing Iowa land Barood. Ross, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think you did a nice job of covering it in the article on our site, which is that he's a good depth piece. You know, he he played center at North Dakota. That's actually a position where Iowa has pretty good depth if, you know, Logan Jones gets healthy and they've got Ellsbury there as well. But, you know, he can also help with the other positions on the interior, you know, the, the guard positions. Um, Iowa's offensive line is, is not such a deep and impressive unit that there is not room for some newcomers to come in and earn playing time. So uh, I, I think he's definitely capable of doing that. And uh, it's good to see them being proactive and trying to, uh, you know, address that depth issue in the offensive line, I think. So, yeah, it seems like a good, uh, a real solid pickup for Iowa. Yeah, to me, this seems like a really a transfer portal success story because he's a guy that had gotten some attention from Iowa came out of Southeast Polk. Uh, but even by his own admission, uh, you know, was not really ready for prime time D or like, or, uh, FBS power five ball. And so instead of being a walk on somewhere, you know, he has this opportunity to go to UND really sort out his, um, career, his, um, priorities, and, um, you know, that, and, and the fact that the, uh, UND coaches were there to sort of help his progression along, get him, like, obviously it's, it's never a football coach's job to get a player ready for some other team, right? The football coach's job is to win games. But, uh, the fact that he was able to grow into the prospect that he really ought to have been and is now able to go to Iowa where he, you know, wanted to go and, and now has proven himself to be ready and, you know, um, to have earned that scholarship in a way that he was not really earning it coming out of high school. I mean, that is what you want the transfer portal to be. So uh, great for him. Uh, great for Iowa, obviously. Ross, like you said, he's a depth piece and Iowa really kind of needs that, especially looking at the second unit that they were trotting out today. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, yeah, this this looks like an unqualified win to me, just full stop. Elliot, how about you? So, you know, I think when we're talking about adding transfer transfers to this roster and we're talking about offensive line, I feel like most people would have wanted a tackle. Um, and, and that includes myself. I mean, when I put together the poll on Twitter and on the, our premium board, I included left tackle because that's probably, I mean, they just lost Caden Proctor, even though he was on the team for about five minutes and Mason Richmond has struggled at left tackle. We'll put it that way. So I would, I would have considered that probably more of a win here, but adding a player like Baroud 
it's definitely not a negative. I mean, he he might well surpass guys like Connor Colby, guys like Bo Stevens at that guard spot before the season starts. Obviously, they've got a spring. They've got uh, a few months a- ahead of him being at Iowa and, and being in Tim Lester's system. But he is a guy that if he doesn't start this year, he could very he could definitely start next year. He could start the year after that. He's a guy that right now you feel a lot more comfortable with your offensive line depth with him on the roster. And I think now is the perfect time for him to come in. He's got three years of eligibility. So at the very least, you're probably going to get two solid years out of him. He's a guy that learned how to take care of his body, learned what it means to be a college football player. And now you're getting not necessarily a ready-made guy, but a guy who you can mold into a player that, that you want. He's a guy that wanted to be a Hawkeye. And to, to add him to the roster is is definitely a, a net positive. Does it fix the offensive line? Does it make him the best offensive line in the country? No, but it is a solid addition. Um, it's it's probably, I wouldn't say the equivalent of adding Rusty Feth because Rusty was kind of a plug and play guy at that left guard spot, um, more or less. Of course, he it took him to get a little while to get in there after Nick DeYoung, but he's a he's a Rusty Feth that you've got three years of instead of a single year. So that's that's ultimately the the net positive that, that you see in adding a guy like Baroud. But um also the the game today, the pre- the open practice, that's that's something we should we should definitely get to to, to transition here. You know, th- there are a lot of things that were good. There were a lot of things that were bad today. And let's 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 start off with the one thing that I think was glaring because I think the sentiment that you shouldn't, you know, make conclusions based on spring ball is pertinent. I think it's, it's the way you should approach talking about spring ball because you got four months, five months until we're actually playing football that matters. And that's generally how I feel. However, I think the one glaring thing you have to take away if you're a member of this this coaching staff or or a, a uh, member of the recruiting staff is you need to go get a quarterback in the portal and you need to do it as soon as possible. You tried with Ty Thompson. He committed to Tulane. Fine. But back on the horse, you got to go get somebody and you got to get somebody that can compete because after Cade McNamara, it is a steep drop off. I don't think either Deacon or or Marco are ready to go right now. And Cade's injury history, obviously, you never hope or or th- you know talk of a, of a quarterback or or a player in general continuing to get hurt, but he has an injury history, so you have to be aware of it at the very least. And so, they need a portal quarterback, and they need one bad. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, having uh, watched how that spring game unfolded, you you saw a little bit of potential out of uh, Marco Linez, especially in the back half. Uh, he he looked rough in seven on sevens, and and there's no other way to put it because some of those throws uh, were not competitive at a Big Ten level. Once they got to eleven on eleven, and he was more able to use some of his uh, footwork in the pocket, really generate his own space and and sometimes extend plays. You saw him get a little bit better uh, when he's on rollouts and his feet are moving. He can throw from um, from the run or, or from a boot. He can be effective at times, but he is not. I, I wouldn't say that he looks Big Ten ready right now. And, you know, part of it is, yes, brand new coordinator brand new offense, and it's the middle of April. He he doesn't have to be ready now, but he's not ready now. And right now, as it stands on April 20th, there aren't any healthy Big Ten quarterbacks on Iowa's roster, Big Ten level quarterbacks. And Cade McNamara is, you know, at the very least on his way. He's projected to be healthy. But we were saying this 12 months ago, too, and obviously things didn't go great, and and some of that's just rotten luck, and you hope that his luck improves, but you want a little bit more stability at quarterback than you hope QB1's luck improves. So, yeah, I, you know, there were some things to be optimistic about 
from the two quarterbacks who got the lion's share of the reps uh, today, but it is pretty telling that Hill and Linus got the lion's share of the reps today and, and not, you know, dipping into the, to the um, Tommy Polsky and the rest of the depth chart by, I mean, Paholsky got on there at the end of practice, but usually in these open practices, the back half is all third stringers and walk-ons because they're the ones that need the reps here right now. I was two top quarterbacks need the reps. So that jumped out at me. Ross, you had something to say. Yeah. Now I didn't get to see the, the practice like you guys did, but you know, I saw some of the comments afterward. And one of the things that jumped out to me was Jay Higgins noting that they, you know, this was not the full offense that they saw during practice the rest of the spring. It was a more pared down version, uh, more vanilla, it sounded like. Um, so to me, I mean, what do you make of the fact that that's the sort of offense they're running today? And, you know, according to what you guys both saw, neither Hill nor Marco were really effective in running that even pared down version of the offense like that after, you know, three weeks or, or a month of practice, essentially. Um, that seems like uh, not the best sign, but I don't know. What did, what did you think? So my initial thoughts and the way you could spin that in a positive way is that probably means more involvement from playmakers, right? In, in terms of, it being pared down when you don't pare it down that involves the playmakers more in more creative ways. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is what you mentioned, Russ. <laughs> like if they can't run it now, when are they going to run it? And I, I'm, you know, I, I tend to, I tend to lean default optimist, but when we're seeing these two quarterbacks miss throws on air and throwing them at the feet or under throwing them. I saw, I don't know how many passes they all, they each completed, but like the only quarterback on this roster that looks like a big 10 quarterback to me is Cade McNamara. That's what I'll say. I was talking to one of the other media members. It's just like you watch and it's like, what? Like there's such a drastic difference between these three quarterbacks, um, these, you know, quarter Cade and, and these two quarterbacks. And like, we saw Cade at the beginning of last season, though he was hurt and he struggled. He wasn't great. So, and, and like, we're talking about the portal, sorry to, to deviate the, the conversation here and feel free to bounce back to what I was talking about, but I do that 20 about... times a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I have to apologize. Well, when we're talking about the portal and quarterbacks, don't be afraid to get a guy that could compete with Cade McNamara this fall. I don't care how much you paid him. I don't care about how he feels about it. This is a Division One football team, Power Four football team, Big Ten football team. You bring in guys that are going to make you better, that can win you football games. If you can do a, get a quarterback that could ultimately be better for you in that regard than Cade McNamara, then you get him. Is it likely that Iowa could land a quarterback like that? I don't know. I you have to think that these guys who are in the portal aren't going to look at Iowa and see it as as their best opportunity. Why did Ty Thompson commit to Tulane with a brand new staff, right? Instead of going to Iowa, I can't blame him. There was one quote that Logan Jones, who was really nice enough to give us some time after the um, practice for interviews, even though he was hurt and didn't suit up or anything like that, but, but he was still out there to talk to us. And he was talking about the job that Tyler Ellsbury did at center. This is related to the conversation, but, um, let me find that one real quick. Um, so he says, uh, every time that Ellsbury goes out there, you never notice a change. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's how it should be. A one to a two, those two should be able to go in there and you shouldn't be able to notice a change. And so what he was talking about is when Ellsbury goes in that the, the level of play doesn't drop off from one guy to the next. And so right now, if McNamara is not in there, there is absolutely a change. There's absolutely a drop off. And so if Iowa brings in that second guy who can compete, who can be that quality backup that, uh, or or even, you know, like you said, 
push McNamara for that starting job. One, if McNamara is that team leader, is that like our goal is to win games kind of guy, and and he's gotten a little bit of um, experience with that over the last year or two, just having to be on the sidelines. But if that is still his goal, then he welcomes that. And if he wants to play quarterback at the next level, and and if uh, you know transfer portal QB X uh, wants to play at the next level too. At the next level, there are great NFL caliber quarterbacks all over the league, like on your roster too. So you can only run from the competition for so long. And if you have these great, if you want to do this, if you want to be the pro, you're going to be competing for your job for pretty much the entire rest of your career. So it it does not have to be something that Iowa coaches need to be afraid of or to, uh, you know, this this is not a kid glove situation. This is a Iowa has an opportunity to really uh, charge up its offense, take care of its biggest glaring weakness. And at some point that has to supersede any idea of, well, but Cade is making X amount of money or Cade is our guy or like we, we put him on top of the death chart when he was hurt for a reason. OK, but, you know. Confidence only gets you so far when it gets to September and there's nobody who's healthy and who can throw a pass against a Big Ten defense or or an Iowa State defense or you know name a powered school defense. You got to do something about it. Ross, I'm curious what your thoughts are on on this. I mean, I agree with you guys. I think it, it's clear that Iowa needs help at the quarterback position in a bad way. You know, I, that, that has been obvious for a long time. You know, I mean, it was obvious all last regular season after Cade went down and we, you know, we watched Deacon for 10, 11 weeks, whatever it ended up being. Uh, We saw him struggle and he struggled a lot, a lot. Uh, We saw Marco briefly in the, in the bowl game and he could run the ball really well. That was, that was strong, but, uh, that was, you know, the extent of his strengths at that point. And obviously, you know, you guys are, have seen a little bit more of the practice stuff than I have, but from what you've reported and what some other people have reported, it doesn't sound like either guy has made huge strides, obviously, uh, from last year. Um, learning a new system, I'm, I'm sure it didn't help, but still, uh, you know, the it is what it is. And the struggles of that position and, you know, just hoping that you're going to get, uh, you know, 12 healthy games out of Cade, you know, it's a cliche, but hope is not a strategy. And uh, if they're going to go into this season with Cade and, you know, only Deacon and Marco as the backups, they're putting them, they're putting a lot of eggs in the, in the Cade basket. And uh, I, I would be very, very nervous about the offense's uh, capability this uh this fall. Um, so yeah, I, I think looking into the portal is a, is a definitely a good idea. It's something they should have been doing hard from January. Uh, I mean, any, like you mentioned with Ty Thompson, like they've poked around, but I think it's, it's been a priority for a while and it sounds like spring practices only, you know, accelerated that priority, if anything. So get out there, uh, beat the bushes, look under every rock you can, they need a quarterback. With that said, you got to think that Tim Lester knows a quarterback out there that's played in an RPO heavy scheme that can come in and instantly make that room better, right? Like he probably offered guys at Western Michigan that are actively like a hell of a lot better than the quarterbacks on Iowa's roster right now, right? Like he's he's got connections in college football. He knows guys in the Illinois area, in the Michigan area. He knows coaches, like high school coaches, even other the, coordinators, right? Like he can call a coach and be like, hey, saw your guy entered the portal, you know, or like, do you know anybody? Like it, I, if if Lester isn't doing, Lester should be doing. We'll, we'll put yeah. it that way. And I, I think like, what did we both say on on Thursday, Adam? It's, it's that Tim Lester is a breath of fresh air. Mm-hmm. And I fully i'm fully behind that statement i believe in that statement and he doesn't seem like a guy who would sit on his hands in this regard 
I do feel like he'd be a guy that would, I know Kirk is the head coach. This is what we need. And I can, I know it. We, I can go get it. Like he, he's a, what are you going to do about it guy when you have a problem? That's something my, my mom always asked me when I had a problem as a kid. Okay. I hear you. What are you going to do about it? And I'm very thankful for that. And I will be thankful for that. If Tim Lester is able to go get a competent quarterback for Iowa that we can watch this fall and not cry. <laughs> you, uh, you, you mentioned something that I think is the, the big key here. And it's, it's not just the high school coaches he knows or, or the, uh, the, the kids that he recruited who, who may be at, you know, a, a power five school or, a, or, or at a max school. I think it is the connections that he's made to other college coaches over the years. And, you know, all you have to do is talk to him for a couple minutes and, and you really understand what a great job he does of connecting with people uh, on a, um, you know, on, on a cordial and professional level, but, but he's very much a talker and a listener as much as a teacher. And so uh, the, it seems prohibitively obvious that if there is an RPO ready QB out there, especially around the Midwest, um, that Lester would not have to make many calls to uh, to get in contact with that kid. So uh, I, I think it will be fascinating to watch how Iowa approaches the rest of the offseason going into uh, summer practice sessions and, and to see whether they address this directly or not. Because, yeah, you know, we, we've said it again, or we've said it already, I'll say it again. Uh, Hill and Linez, as they look today, did not look close to being able to compete regularly on the Big Ten level. And I know that's weird to say that about, you know, Deacon Hill, whose record as a starter is what, five and three, six and three <laughs> against like power five competition. But I mean, all you had to do is watch that games or, you know, watch those games. And um, his shortcomings were obvious. And I, you know, it, it, it would have been uh, unfair to expect him to look like Peyton Manning after 15 practices with a brand new uh, offense and a brand new coordinator. But you did want to see more improvement than what he showed today. And uh, it's it really sort of solidified the notion that this is probably going to be a problem with some outside help is the answer as opposed to development. Yeah. Because development, they're going to need a lot of it, and they aren't going to be getting it anytime soon with the guys on the roster. James Reeser, for as much as I like him, he's not going to be able to come in and start day one uh, out of Florida, the 2024 signee. Now, speaking of the offense, speaking of places that they've struggled, the wide receiving core is very, very, very thin. I look at the roster right now. The three guys that are receivers and one's like a flex, the flex who plays a combination of running back and receiver. And one of them's a walk on the three that I think give any sort of juice or energy to this offense that I can, that, that you can trust to make a play. Hayden Weijin, Caleb Brown and TJ Washington to me at this very moment, as far as receivers go, that's it. Of course you, you can trust Luke Lachey in the passing game. Of course, Hassan Oshrenga, assuming he's, healthy sooner rather than later i think he he had a wrap around his hand i don't know if he was if it was broken or or what was going on there but um assuming he's back and healthy for fall that'll be beneficial but caleb brown's a playmaker caden weijin is fast as all hell and tj washington's a playmaker those three guys are the ones you can trust in the receiving core right now i don't think dayton howard or jerry at Bowie caught passes today um and Alex Moda's hurt. So, and correct me if I'm wrong, if Dayton and, and Bowie caught passes during the 11 on 11 period today, because I didn't see it if that's the case. But KJ Parker, Reese Vandersee, again, they're coming in as freshmen. I don't expect them to contribute right away either. I don't know how they're going to make it work, but that's another position you probably should go portaling for. Like they're at 90 scholarship now, scholarships now with Baroud. Uh, now on the uh, scholarship chart. I don't know what they're going to do. Adam, you had a couple of things there. Yeah, there's there's just one. Uh, let's also throw Seth Anderson in the mix. He's been hurt for most of the spring. Uh, yeah, but, my bad. Uh, it, and, and Kirk did mention that, um, you know, he was out. Um, one second here. 
cough button. We'll fix it in post. Uh, but uh, as I said it's a soft tissue thing and um, should be fine in, in June and, and said that in the limited amount of practice that uh, Anderson did get to make uh, in the spring that he looked good. So uh, there is still some optimism on the staff's front for uh, Flipper Jr., uh, although I, I think Seth hates that name. So that's the last time I'm going to say that. Uh, but so there is that one other guy, but we also saw him last year and he had a long way to go in terms of being uh, consistently productive. You know, he obviously had that big splash uh, that, that's another Dolphin reference, another big splash TD to open up the season. But uh, he was he had some of the most unreliable hands on the team last year. And there were not a whole lot of reliable pairs of hands in that wide receiver core. So until we get to see, you know, the, the world at large gets to see that uh, improvement on the field, um, and, and we obviously didn't get to see it during the spring, but until we get to see that in the summer into the fall, you know, he's still as much a question mark as guys like Bowie or Howard or uh, any other, any of the other young guys. So, you know, he, he is in that mix, but he has as much to prove as pretty much anybody uh, uh, in that core. Uh, did we miss anybody else, Ross? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, it's a, it's a short list, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, I was going to bring up Anderson and you, you mentioned him. I mean, he did play last year uh, and you mentioned the drops as an issue. His snap count also dropped precipitously over the back half of the season. So like he wasn't getting on the field. And I mean, the receiving situation last year was not great either. So, you know, that's concerning. Uh, like you, you mentioned, you know, Kirk said he had a good spring before he got a little banged up. So that's a good sign. Um, you know, hopefully that carries over into summer and fall. Uh, we didn't get you guys didn't get to see it. You didn't get to see it, obviously, but yeah, they they need bodies to step up. And I, I think Elliot's right. It's another position where they could use some portal help. Although uh, how they're going to make that math work is is going to take some uh, some doing because you know they are five over right now after adding a, a Barud today. Um, so you know if you want to add a quarterback and add a receiver and get down to 85 that's seven scholarships that got to get freed up so that's a not insignificant number and maybe a left tackle <laughs> and yeah that if too. you got if you got a left tackle on your shopping list too then now you're up to eight scholarships that need to get freed up so that that's uh that's not easy and like the one thing I've said repeatedly throughout this whole thing when talking about Iowa's uh, scholarship situation, which I mm, just updated the uh, the scholarship chart with uh, Baroud to it. The one thing I've said repeatedly is around the country this time of year after a season, it's pretty common for staffs to say, we can't, this guy's got to go, this guy's got to go, this guy's got to go, this guy's got to go. Whether it's like, portal or or the injury the medical thing um more often than not it's like look man the writing's on the wall you're not gonna play sorry scoot on out of here um we're a family we're a family if you produce right we're a family if you're good kirk doesn't operate like that i don't know how they're gonna figure this out unless nil comes into play um, which of course we've got we've got something cooking on on that regarding an article um, here sooner rather than later, but this is a uh, this is a tough spot for this team to be in. You can, it's almost like you can have your morals or you can figure out your scholarship situation, right? Like it's 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 a tough spot for for Kirk and and for Tyler Barnes to be in, and Tim Lester for that matter. He needs a lot of help. He needs a lot of help right now. Yeah, he I does. Really think, and... I, I was just going to say that the COVID year has really brought this to a head because, you know, it, it's great that Iowa gets another year out of Jay Higgins and Nick Jackson uh, and, and Quinn Schulte and a couple other guys on defense. But that that that's another, you know, three, four, five scholarships uh, that are getting used that would be available for, uh, you know, other, other players. And 
So that that scholarship math is definitely getting challenged by the COVID stuff. But uh, yeah, it is definitely a big issue that they got to figure out. Uh, sorry, Adam, you were going to say something. No, I was just trying to fill some silence. We're good. Cool. All right. Uh, anything else to talk about on the offense? I mean, like the Kamari Moulton looked good in, in some snaps. Uh, TJ Washington, again, the flexibility between wide receiver and running back. I think he's a playmaker. Uh, Jazz Patterson needs some help, too, with the passing offense because downhill runner, man, it's great when you have some space to work with. But when you're they're crowding the box and they know where the ball is going, that's tough. You can't get ahead of steam. Uh, and and he he needs as much help as as the rest of the, the 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 crew on on offense. And I'd probably say the same thing about Caleb Johnson, though Caleb Johnson didn't make a few plays today. Go ahead, Ross. I was going to say there's no uh, no Lashawn today, right? He was he was out. Yep, pinged oh. up. Yep, yeah, had a boot. He, uh, had a boot on. Yeah, uh, at the very least, he he also um, came out to do uh, interviews with all of us. So so I. Not a whole lot of long-term concern there, but yeah, he was out. Uh, Caleb Johnson looked good in space and looked like he could be a, a bit of a, a weapon in terms of the passing game. Uh, Jazz Patterson, uh, yeah, I, I think he will be helped by this new offense just because he won't be running into uh, nine-man fronts with the linebackers crashing the uh, line of scrimmage on every single play like they were last year. But he is also a guy who could really stand to be as... Uh, productive in space as we saw uh, Moulton, Washington, and yeah, like you said, Caleb Johnson uh, today, because at some point, you know, these guys' roles are changing in the new offense as much as, I mean, pretty much anybody's. Like, I, I think the biggest difference, aside from like just the motion, but the biggest difference in terms of roles is the way the backfield is used. And, and a perfect example is Hayden Large. You know, Iowa didn't do a ton with fullbacks today and and Hayden spent a, a pretty decent amount of time like on the on the line and you know it's not quite his strong suit so you know how these guys adjust to like how do the running backs adjust to being you know to playing more in space to being more of receiving threats how does uh, Iowa adjust its offense without having that fullback in there uh, as often and, and we saw a little bit of that last year but it's really going to kick up this year you know these guys will have to adjust the way that they play as much as anything. And, and so as long as it's catered to their strengths, great. But this is a, a little bit reminiscent of when Greg Davis came in and Iowa's receivers, which were still more like Ken O'Keefe receivers. It, it, it basically turned into an exodus in that depth chart too, because those guys were not built for that quick Greg Davis passing offense. And it turns out that offense wasn't that good either, but uh, that, had a sort of a long-term effect. So you hope you don't see that with the backfield uh, and you probably won't see as much of it happen with this go around, but yes, there will be a little bit of transition and there will be guys who thought they were in position to succeed with their skill sets. And they might start to see that sort of slipping away as Iowa's offense changes. Ross, you had something. I did. Uh, you mentioned the motion. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about that, what you saw from the motion today? Like, how much did they use? What did it look like? Because that's obviously been a major theme uh, this whole spring in terms of the Tim Lester offense and everything. So um, just say a little yeah, bit they, about that, I guess. Yeah, they, they showed a few things, although uh, Jay Higgins made sure to mention after the game that uh, it, was, it was a pared down version of it because they didn't want to put a whole lot on film. And to some level, I get that, you know, there, there were obviously people on social media who were like, ah, it's excuses already. Blah, 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 blah. And that's, that's not, I mean, if you take a quote out of context, great, congratulations, you're good at social media now, but that wasn't really the case. Like they were consciously and it, and it's consistent with everything that we had heard coming from these guys during spring, which was, man, they're throwing so much at us. And, and it even got to the point where uh, Jay said, um, this is the first time in a long time that the defense was adding packages during spring practice in order to compete with the offense, which one is not a great look for Brian Ferentz. <laughs> 
in absentia. Uh, but but two really goes to the level of challenge that Lester was able to provide just in those 15 days of practice. So yeah, they didn't show quite as much, but there was a clip, uh, Tyler Tashman of the Register uh, posted a clip of Iowa using some um, motion short side, like a, a jet sweep motion to the short side, and then immediately like turning it into a um, toss play to um, Caleb Johnson going the other direction. And a big part of why they did that was because there was a, a defender trailing um, I, I think it was Weijin that was coming on motion and there was a defender trailing him, which you kind of have to because Elliot, like you said, Caden Weijin is really fast. So all of a sudden the defense is back on its heels and having to read and react even before the snap. And if all that does is create a half second of wait a second from the defense, a guy like Caleb Johnson, who's also really fast, can make use of that. Like that's a, like half a second is essentially like a five yard cushion with these, with the way these guys are sprinting. So that can be a game changing uh, adjustment in and of itself. And, and so we did get to see some of that. And, you know, how well is Iowa going to be able to incorporate all that? How well will I, I mean, we don't have to worry about Iowa's defense <laughs> adjusting to it once the season starts, but how well will other teams' defenses be able to read and react to it? I don't think we're going to hear as many quotes from opposing defenders uh, in 24 that uh, that they said, you know, over the last five years about how easy it is to prepare for Iowa. I don't think we're going to get a whole lot of that this year. And especially a guy like Lester. And I, I, I think it's actually going to be really, really good for Lester that he's coaching against Phil Parker day in and day out. And, and Jay Higgins in his longer answer spoke at length in terms of like the chess match that goes on in, in the way that these guys are not only, um, you know, using reads to do their job, but the coaches are, understanding what those reads are and making adjustments off of said reads like it, it's it's really fascinating stuff and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that improves Lester as a uh, play caller as a, a you know a um, in-game adjustment maker I think it's going to make him a better coach and so how quickly does that improvement make its way to the field how easily does that translate to the players as opposed to you know coaches and x's and o's you know it's x's and o's are great but it's really about the rex's and joe's and so are these guys going to turn it into production on the field i think that we're going to see some of that especially as the year progresses and as these guys get used to playing that offense against opposing defenses the hostile defenses but it's something to watch and, and something that's going to be pretty cool to see Yes. Now, the other thing that we need to talk about, we already hit on uh, the the addition of Cade Baroud as as a transfer. But Adam, you wrote about the offensive line. You saw improvement today. Yeah, I did, and a big part of it was just schematic because, again, the opposing defense can't just crash the line on eighty to ninety percent of the plays. And so, uh, like like Lester mentioned on Thursday. You know, if, if a linebacker is making the tackle, but he's not allowed or not allowed, but he's making that tackle from his starting spot, congratulations, that's four yards instead of one yard. And if you're trying to string together third down conversions and if you're trying to string together drives, you want those third and shorts. You, you want to, you know, not be behind schedule. And so just getting these guys the opportunity to succeed essentially like <laughs> because it's it's pretty much impossible to block you know six on nine or you know five on eight so one schematically they're better off two uh you, you really start to see that um veteran leadership and, and veteran presence um you know especially from guys like tyler ellsbury and um nick de young you know guys who have bounced around uh, the line and and really learned roles in different spots. And so, I mean, let's remember, there were two starters out today. It was mostly precautionary because, again, it's April. But this wasn't even the full-strength version of the team, and they had veteran guys that they could plug in there into those spots just to be able to compete. And, and like 
uh, Logan Jones said, you didn't really notice all that much of a difference. Now, some a lot of the uh, more productive Russian plays were to the edges and, and and out to the boundary. And so you didn't really see that like five yard push. And, and you're really not going to see a whole lot of that when it's Aaron Graves and Jeremiah Pittman that you're trying to push five yards. Like, good luck with that. But um, you didn't see a whole lot of whiffs, especially from the first unit. Second unit, the the guys who were, you know, mostly redshirt freshmen had a few more of those, even going up against the second team. But this this unit, at the very least, you know, Mason Richmond, you know, wasn't great, but he was making good blocks. Iowa was able to spring a few nice looking runs here or there, even though, you know, defenders weren't allowed to tackle. Uh, there did look like a little bit of improvement. And uh, Lester in particular on Thursday had mentioned that uh, pace was going to be a big part of that, that the Iowa, you know, they're not going to go up tempo or anything like that. It's not going to be Texas Tech or anything, but they do want to operate that RPO offense, especially, you know, get up to the line, hit the snap, blow the guys off the ball. They want that part to be done with pace. And so we started to see a little bit of that today. And as opposed to getting to the line, look around for 15 seconds and then, you know, run one of your two or three rush plays. So they, and, and Lester even mentioned that this is a little bit of an adjustment for them. So, you know, again, it's the middle of April and we'll see how these things look in September, but they're excited about that part. They, they are really optimistic about how this team can put together a rushing offense with pace, with strength, with tempo. And it, it, it also helps to have great blocking tight ends too. Let's not forget that part. So there is absolutely optimism on the offensive line. They didn't look great today. And I, so don't, don't go telling social media that I said Iowa's offensive line is going to win the Joe Moore award or anything like that, but they looked capable they they look like a bunch of guys who have been on a football field for three years at least um i didn't i didn't really see any all big 10 caliber play nobody really jumped out like that but again two starters out middle of april brand new coordinator brand new offense they're they were never going to look like a finished product they, that was that was never going to be realistic but they look like they had been out there practicing, competing, improving, and it didn't look like a disaster in the making. And I mean, even on some good offensive lines over the years, like Ross, I think you can attest to, there have been some rough springs, especially going up against these defenses over the years. So, I mean, that they look like they were ready to hold their own against a really, really good, talented, experienced Iowa defense. And I mean, you want to see him do better. Nobody's calling it perfect, but it was an improvement. I I think you got to call it an improvement. There were still some sacks, right? Oh yeah, what would be sacks? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> plenty of and, those. And De Deacon Hill doesn't help that on that front either. Like one of the big things that I really wanted to see out of him today was a sign that the game had started to slow down for him. And you still saw him start to waffle around in the pocket a little bit too much. There, there was one like strip sack, uh, which is amazing when you're not allowed to touch the QB. But uh, Rex Roth came untouched on a um, on a blitz on that third and goal from the three and just swatted the ball out of his hands. But again, that thing or, or that play is only so much on Deacon Hill. And and I saw the coaches talking to, I think it was Caleb Johnson, but I I don't don't quote me on that one. But uh, one of the running backs got a little uh, chat after that one. So it was a missed block, but it's also a situation where, you know, a different quarterback, a more athletic quarterback, maybe can make something happen on that. But I mean, it was just a straight shot for Rex Roth and, and a guy like that who would be starting on, I would wager at least half of FBS teams at this point. Um, you know, only so much you're going to be able to do about that. Speaking of, Rex Roth, uh, well, the defense is still going to be it's one of the best stacked. in the country. Like, that's yeah. overdone. Like, I almost don't even, like, with eight of 11 starters back, uh, you know, a few of them sidelined. Jamari Harris didn't play today. He hasn't been super active throughout the spring. But 
they're you just you just know that they're going to be elite again right of course we have the questions about the defensive tackle depth but that's almost nitpicky compared to what the issues are with the offense it is nitpicky compared to what the issues are with the offense and that second group of linebackers man i i that was the one thing like that's new to me today that I felt like we could point out. Carson Shire had a pick six. Jackson Rexroth had a pick six. Got his jersey ripped, which I have a picture of on on Twitter. Um, I can't remember who's. I think it was. Hmm, I can't remember who said it. It might have been Nick Jackson. But once Jackson re, re, Rexroth ran over to the sideline, Nick Jackson was like, "That's got to be holding, right?" <laughs> As his jersey's <laughs> hanging. Um, but I really like those two i really like uh jaden harrell i think it was shire who got the uh, majority of the reps at the leo spot with kyler fisher out today i like them all i i think iowa's linebacking core is gonna just continue to be awesome for years to come this 24 class coming in is is really good i just i that's really the only new thing for me today i did want to see cohen i did want to see more i want to see more of zach lutmer right now um, but of course, Cohen mm-hmm. was sidelined, Jamari was sidelined, uh, and I, and there was another player that I mentioned that I'm now for. Oh, uh, Kyler Fisher was was sidelined, but mm-hmm. I I I want to see Cohen out there. I'm really excited to see what he does, assuming he's at the cash. Um, he's one of those guys that, from what we saw towards the end of the last season, he's just like too good to keep him off the field. You got to find a way to get him out there, whether it's just special teams or whatever. And he's made a commitment to staying at Iowa, no matter who is in that secondary. He said that when, when Quinn was still making his decision. So um, I, I really don't have anything else to say about the defense. Uh, I, I really like those second string linebackers, but that was pretty much it. Yeah. One, one more name to throw into the mix of linebacker. Cause you know, what they needed was another productive name, but uh, Jade Montgomery looked pretty good too. Uh, in in the limited snaps that he got, so uh, just an embarrassment of riches at that position. So we've been saying it, maybe, and it's unfortunate to say it because there are so many good players, but maybe that's maybe that's where we see some of that scholarship issues be alleviated because some of those guys deserve to be on a football field somewhere. Yeah, if if, if that's what they want out of this season, I mean, I, if if I were one of those guys. And I'm like, all right, I've waited my turn behind a a, a Nick Jackson or a Jay Higgins or a, or a Kyler Fisher or a you know Sebastian Castro. I've learned from the best. My turn, my time. Oh, it's another year of that. You know that. So, what are your priorities at that point? Are are you committed to Iowa City? Are you committed to the program? It, or is it a I've only got this limited window to play college ball. I, uh, at some point I'm here to do more than be a cheerleader if, if, with this scholarship. I, I want to make something out of this and get the most out of myself that I can. Yeah. And, and I don't think there would be anybody in Iowa city who's going to say, Oh, what the heck? Uh, and, and and I'm not going to mention anybody by name because I didn't want to push anybody out the door, but I mean, what the heck, you know, LB three, like you're not a real hawk like nobody would even think that at this point it's a it's a like go do what you got to do so it's yeah it's it's absolutely a um you know an interesting situation for that defense in particular and um and you know what's the balance between talent and depth and making sure these guys are going after their own goals too so we'll we'll see how that shakes out. I, I would imagine there's going to be some uh, recognizable names hitting the portal. And uh, and if that's the case, hey, Godspeed, good luck. Like go, you know, maybe don't go to somebody that's going to play Iowa <laughs> for the fans sake. But but other than that, and, you know, if that is their best opportunity too, all right, great, go do it, you know? So moving on to special teams here. I, I again, I don't necessarily think there's a ton to take away. Reese Dakin was punting into the wind for a good portion of today. Uh, Drew Stevens missed like a 56 yard field goal attempt, something wild that would have been difficult to make without wind. I mean, those were the two, I guess you could consider them negatives, but Reese also put, put one inside the five from, I think, the opposite side of the field, which was a really nice punt. He had the wind to his back. Um, Ty Nissen, solid good to have on the roster Reese is going to be the punter this year 
And then Trip Woody was Drew's backup, another kind of the same situation. Good enough. Good to be the backup. But uh, I mean, I, I trust LeVar Woods fully to to get that situation figured out. And we didn't really see much of returns or, or who was doing Gunner because they pretty much caught the punt and called it good. But the sentiment regarding Reese is that he's not Tory Taylor right now. And he's not. And we shouldn't expect him to be. And to hold him to that standard is probably not fair to a guy who was 26 out there punting uh, as the best in college college uh, college football to now a 19 year old. So um, that's that's pretty much where I'm at with special teams. I, I think we'll uh, learn and, and see more in the fall. How about you, Ross? I was just going to say we're like 50 plus minutes into this podcast and we haven't talked about punting yet, which I think is probably a, an extreme disservice to our listeners. So the I apologize sin. for the, the crime <laughs> against humanity. I apologize for that. But um, no, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about Reese Dakin. And it's, you know, it's he's such in a different circumstance than Tory Taylor. It's just Tory Taylor was a 26 year old. He came to Iowa late. He had four years of development here. Like by last year, he was exceptional, you know, arguably the best punter Iowa has ever had. And that includes Reggie Roby, who was an incredible punter in his own right. Uh, so to go, you know, anything is going to be a step down from what Tory Taylor was last year. So, you know, you just cannot hold Dakin to that standard. It, it would be extremely unfair, but uh, you know, it sounds like he, he has a lot of ability in his own right. And, so, no, I mean, I, I think Iowa fans should not prepare for, you know, a, a repeat of Tory Taylor's season last year. I mean, for one thing, I mean, God help us if we see that many punts this fall. I mean, nobody wants to see that. I mean, it was great that Tory got to break that Michigan State dude's record that had been around for decades and whatever. But, I mean, he got that opportunity because the offense gave him like 10 chances a game to punt the ball, unfortunately. So don't want to see that this year, but I think there's a lot, um, uh, a lot of potential with Dakin, obviously, and excited to see how that, how, how that develops. And uh, what about Drew Stevens? Um, you know, he, he, LeVar uh, Woods had some great comments about him and his development uh, on Thursday. Uh, he, you know, got, had a really tough end of the season last year, um, got benched in that Nebraska game. And then didn't get to take any more uh, attempt any kicks uh, the last the next two games because Iowa unfortunately got shut out in both games. And sorry to bring up those ugly memories. Um, but what did uh, what did he look like today? What what did you see from Stevens? Well, I mean, one sort of going back to the punting real quick. Um, the the whole punting is winning and Tory Taylor MVP thing, and and it's it's cool to see the fans really embrace. Uh, guys like that. And, and Tory Taylor is one of the most likable guys that's ever put on a Hawkeye uniform. But there was a a huge element of gallows humor to all that, too. It was a like the the absurdity of it all informed it as much as anything, because if, if you're not having fun with the punters, then you're watching some dreadful offense. And, and so, yeah, you you really hope that nothing like that uh, happens under Lester, especially this season too, or else I, I think the fun is going to sort of get sucked out of Iowa City if, when there isn't a punching bag like Brian Ferentz around anymore. Uh, so, yeah, I, I I don't think it's going to get as cute if the offense is punting, you know, eight to ten times a game again this season, uh, especially because again, uh, Dakin is not Tory Taylor. And, you know, he was he was punting into a stiff win and and the coaches have mentioned that that's something that he's going to have to get used to. And, and you know, he he mentioned that himself. But I, I was watching him and, and taking notes and he was just sitting 35 or 40 net yards kicking into that win, which on some level is pretty good. Because, again, Elliot, like you mentioned, when he wasn't punting into that, that coffin corner kick was a like, wow moment. I think he's going to be good pretty soon. Is it going to be an all-time great like Tory Taylor? Like that's that's not even a fair standard to hold anybody to, uh, regardless of what city in Australia they're from. Uh, in terms of Stevens, uh, he looked noticeably better than Trip Woody today. Uh, Woody missed a few 
chippies. And uh, another media member said that that was a little bit consistent with how he'd been uh, kicking in spring practice too. So Stevens, at the very least, like Elliot, yeah, he did miss that 56-yarder, and it looked a little bit short, a little bit wide. Uh, he did hit one from about that distance later in the practice as we were heading down to uh, uh, go to interviews. So the leg is still there, and the confidence from the coaches is still there. So, yeah, I, I think he looked improved. Now, when you're kicking in practice for this long, and, and this many opportunities, you are going to miss a couple. And, and we did see him miss a couple. But by and large, he looked noticeably better than Woody, had a stronger leg than Woody. And uh, I, I would say any sort of questions about who's the you know K1 on this team, uh, I, I, I think there is not going to be an or on this depth chart anytime soon. There you have it. Those are our takeaways from the open practice that was held today in Iowa City at Kinnick Stadium or yesterday if you're listening here on Sunday. Either way, we appreciate you tuning in to this episode of Hotcast. Wherever you're listening, make sure you hit that subscribe button. If you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, leave that rate and review. If you're on YouTube, drop a comment, drop a like, let us know what you're thinking about Iowa heading into summer post spring practice. What are they going to do with all these scholarships? Tell us because somebody's got the solution out there. We're just trying to figure it out. Again, we appreciate you tuning into this episode. Uh, before you go, also, if you're not a premium subscriber yet, make sure you do that today at iowithoutrivals.com backslash subscribe. You get all the insider information from us on football and basketball recruiting, as well as basketball and football right there. And uh, that's pretty much it. Appreciate you tuning in. Thanks so much. I am Elliot Clough at Elliot Clough on Twitter, joined by Ross Binder, managing editor, and Adam Jacoby, publisher at iowa.rivals.com. For now, we will see you next time.